Well, welcome everybody. You arrived at Technology, Mind and Behavior, a home for media psychology and welcome. My name is Dr. Jerry Lynn Hogg and I'm the director of the media psychology program at Fielding Graduate University. And I'd like to thank you for joining us today. I'm very pleased to in introduce uh, the following panel. In 2020, the American Psychological Association launched their newest open access journal, Technology, Mind and Behavior. And we're really fortunate to have the panelists here that are editors and also can share their research in the area. I know I personally have attended all the uh, technology, mind, and uh, society, I believe it was called, conferences and felt it was very compelling and directly related to media psychology. So I was beyond thrilled to see this journal emerge. And so I think you are in for a real treat. The panel is being um, moderated by Danielle McNamara and uh, Dr. McNamara is a professor of psychology in the psychology department at Arizona State University, where I'm sure it's nice and warm right now. Uh, Dr. McNamara is joined today by Dr. Sean Green. Dr. Sean Green is an associate professor in the department of psychology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Dr. Nick Bowman is an associate professor, journalism and creative media industries at Texas Tech University. And finally, Dr. Isabel Granite is a professor of developmental psychopathology in the Behavioral Science Institute at Radbun University. Hopefully I said that right, Isabella. Welcome. Now I wanna take a little bit just for a second to talk about the housekeeping. We will have a Q&A period that will follow the panel's formal presentation and we'll draw all those questions from the chat window. So feel free to put those in as soon as you have a question. And we have uh, our PhD student, Jake Grant here, uh, that will be capturing those. We ask that you be respectful and refrain from any comments or actions that might be seen as bullying, discriminatory, harassment, or that display inappropriate content. Anyone not respecting this code of conduct will be removed from the meeting. We want this to be a positive experience for all of you, and we thank you for your help and understanding with that. And I'd like to give a shout out, I already sort of did in the background, to our PhD student, Jake Grant, for providing the behind the scenes backup for today's presentation. And now I'd like to turn it over to you, uh, Dr. McNamara. Thank you, Jerry, very much appreciate it. Um, I, I'm gonna start just by having everyone introduce themselves. Um, uh, shall we? I, I'll introduce myself. I'm Danielle McNamara, and I am the editor of the new journal, Technology, Mind, and Behavior. I'm at Arizona State University, as, as Jerry said, and I do research uh, across a number of areas having to do with intelligent tutoring systems, artificial intelligence, uh, collaboration, writing, comprehension, um, and uh, building tools for researchers and students and teachers. And so uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and go in order and uh, ask uh, Sean to, can you introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, all that stuff. Sure, so I'm Sean Green, I'm, uh, the Associate Editor at uh, Technology, Mind, and Behavior. Um, um, uh, Associate Professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, my research focuses on uh, largely perceptual and cognitive learning. And uh, in doing that, we make use of kind of lab-based, you know, psych physical tasks, but also a lot of modern media. So in particular, modern video games. Um, we're interested in the impact of playing certain types of video games on cognitive skills, in particular, perceptual skills. Um, and increasingly on other things like uh, perception of emotion. Great, thanks. Uh, Nick? Yeah, so my name is Nick Bowman. I'm an associate professor at Texas Tech uh, out here in West Texas desert. And um, I've been doing gaming and VR research and really interactivity research for about 15 years now. And my primary focus is on sort of how we make sense of this notion of um, this demand that when you're using an interactive medium, you have to do something. You, you, you can't let it sit there. You've got to touch it, think about it, feel through it, talk to others and, and, and things of that nature. And uh, here at Tech, I, I established the, uh, the Interaction Lab after being at uh, West Virginia for about 10 years. And that's going to be an important role when I talk about my research a little bit. Um, 
I'm the incoming editor for the Journal of Media Psychology, but for this conversation, I'm working with Technology, Mind, Behavior is one of the special editors for the registration series we'll talk about as well. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Isabella. Yeah, so my name is Isabella Granick, and I'm a professor in developmental psychopathology in the Netherlands right now. And I'm um, the director of the Gains for Emotional and Mental Health Lab, which is a lab that's been working for about eight years on trying to design, um, develop, and collaborate with other designers, uh, commercial and otherwise, video games, and also other kinds of social media apps that promote uh, emotional resilience for young people and also prevent mental health problems like anxiety and depression is what we mostly focus on. So we have in-house game designers and engineers that work with us, but we also partner up with commercial um, entities and companies that are like-minded in that they want to have a positive impact on young people. And we try to take evidence-based practices from clinical and developmental psychology and sort of underpin these games with these mechanics that get translated from scientific principles and practices that have been shown to work for anxiety and depression, for example, and then create these engines of change through video games. And then we run randomized control trials to see whether they work as well or even better in some cases than uh, conventional therapy or other intervention approaches. Yeah. Great. Oh, and for this purpose in uh, this conversation, I'm also an action editor, the same thing as uh, Nick. Uh -huh. Great, thanks so much. All right, I'm gonna um, share my screen now to start a presentation. Hopefully I can make it work this time. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what you're seeing. Are you seeing the uh, correct one now? Yep, I'll go. Okay, wonderful. So we've already introduced ourselves and um, we're going to talk about the journal. And um, also the topic for today has to do with a special issue we're doing. Um, oh, we're, oh, first, so let me tell you a little bit about the journal. Um, we've, we've started a journal called Technology, Mind, and Behavior, and its focus is on empirical studies related to the interaction between technology, mind, and behavior. And that covers a really broad spectrum of topics. We intend to um, cover things having to do with, as you can see a lot, the, the panelists here are all focused on games of some sort and social media uh, as well from different perspectives. And that captures what we're trying to do at the journal is better understand how technology affects mind and behavior, affect and as well as how we interact with um, how we interact with technology. Um, some interesting aspects or novel aspects of this journal, it's an APA journal, it's also open access. So the notion is we really want everyone to have access to good research, solid research on this topic. And this means making access open to everyone, even if you don't have access to um, a great library or uh, funds to buy a journal subscription. Another aspect is that it's both online as well. Uh, there is a PDF that's nicely formatted, but it's online so we can have interaction uh, we can have videos, we can have um, various other uh, uh, aspects that are less uh, typical of a typical of uh, most uh, print journals. And so uh, we're very excited about it. We have our first papers uh, up right now, and we're gonna have uh, quite a few more in coming up soon. And I'm really happy to have Nick and Isabella here because they are two of our first papers. So I'm just thrilled that we have them and they're gonna be talking about their research and then and both the paper that they published recently in t uh, technology, mind, and behavior, as well as more broadly, some of their own re uh, their other research. So I'm going to turn it over to Nick now 
to tell you about his paper and a little bit more about his research. Well, thank you for that. And, and um, I'm definitely excited about the journal itself. Um, and I shared a link to this actual paper in the chat for folks who are following along because it is open access. So dialing in there is, is pretty simple. And I'll want to talk about some of the interactivity elements that are involved with the journal that I really like. So my introduction to the journal was through the Technology Minus Society Conference that had been held in DC for two years in a row. And um, there is still a version digitally that was hoping to be in Denver this year. So for folks who are new to that space, that conference, I think this would be the third year, I believe. And it's very quickly grown into a conference that is gathering not just psychologists, but people who play in the media psychology space in particular. And I've had a lot of great interactions there. And in fact, one of them inspired this research. So back when I was at West Virginia for about 10 years, uh, the video game Fallout 76 came out. And for those of you who are gamers, and maybe even if you're not a gamer, you'll appreciate the notion. The game was framed around being in Appalachia, right? So this is a part of the United States. It does not often get a whole lot of attention. And when it does, it's stereotypically pretty bad. It's the butt of a lot of jokes, right? It's not, it's not uncommon to have media properties be in large cities, New York, London, San Francisco, Berlin. We've seen those landmarks. But it was a little different to have a landmark uh, that most folks are not familiar with. So what's on screen right now is Woodburn Hall from West Virginia University, which is where I taught for nearly 10 years. And then behind that smaller image is Woodburn Hall in the video game. Now, absent the statue of the little guy out front, and of course they couldn't call it West Virginia University, it was called Vault Tech University, which plays a big part of the role, the narrative in the game. This was an example of taking authentic locations that many of us are probably not that familiar with and sharing them with the world who's probably never seen them before. You know, so when Fallout 76 comes out, it's a video game about nuclear war and the first survivors of the nuclear war in the United States are West Virginians, which if you know about your, your US history, there actually is a nuclear vault in West Virginia at, at the uh, golf course in town. There was, uh, um, so it played a bit off of this uh, historical element of we were sort of the secret bunker for the U.S. Congress. Um, it plays off this stereotype of Appalachians being hard scrabble survivals, you know, very tough people who will work this out. So it kind of fit into the lore of this game that those first people that come out would be, be the, the best of this hardworking region. It got me interested, of course, because I live there because I played there. And I mean, seeing as a professor, seeing your office in a video game was, was pretty cool. And that office wasn't the White House or the Lincoln Memorial, right? It was a cl college classroom. What I became curious about is this notion of the sense of place. And it's a, it's a concept from cultural geography that refers to how we emotionally connect to locations as if they were, you know, in many ways we connect to people. So many of us on this call could probably tell you a little bit about a city, you know, New York or St. Louis, or just pick a city out of the air and we could tell you a street name or something. In our article, we talk about Indianapolis because it happened to be the case that we we're going to a conference that year. We tell the story of how all three of the authors can tell you about Indianapolis, but we all have a very different story behind it. I went to a Big Ten university, so my stories in Indianapolis were a little more juvenile because I was there playing as a college student, right? Well, what we wondered is you've got this property where people are gonna play this, you know, the game didn't do well critically as a spoiler alert, but going into the game, lots of hype around it. It's the next Fallout game. You're gonna have millions of players interacting in a real world location they've never heard of, other than to know Appalachia, Hillbillies, some jokes and puns here and there. Well, by probability alone, we knew that some of those players were probably going to be West Virginians. And so what we decided to do was follow them. And we were able to recruit about 600 players. And we followed them for three months. Going into the study, we asked them about their sense of place for West Virginia. You know. And then two weeks after playing, so they've been spending time in this game, we asked them again, uh, among other questions, about their sense of place for West Virginia as, as an authentic location. And then two months later, we asked them a third time, now that you've been playing, how do you feel connected emotionally to West Virginia, not in the video game, but the real world location of West Virginia. 
nice thing about this study is not only did we get groups of people who were from West Virginia and groups of folks who would never, who were not from the area, but naturally not everybody was still playing at time three, which creates a really cool control group. The game didn't do that well critically. So a lot of folks bailed after a couple of weeks, but they stayed in the study the whole time. And so we were able to control, we were able to compare these growth rates between the two. What we found is that no surprise, at the beginning of the study, the West Virginians had a higher sense of place for West Virginia than the non-West Virginians. If nothing else, it was a validation that we had a good scale that can distinguish in the ways that we expected to distinguish. The non-West Virginians who played the game over this period of time, their sense of place scores rose, it's the green arrow, to where they fell within the tolerance of the native West Virginians. You could argue they all started sharing similar levels of sense of place. Half of them, of course, lived there. The other ones had never been there before, except through this video game. And then on the other side of the screen, you had the people who played, were playing at time two, but stopped playing at time three. And you see their scores go up and then drop back down again. The wider confidence intervals are due to the fact that there weren't as many non-players as there were players. What we think we found in this study is an argument that suggests that when we spend time in digital locations, it's not that we have just a sense of presence, like we feel like we're in them. We start to feel an emotional connection to those places that goes beyond recognizing a mountain or a building. And that emotional connection can translate over to the actual places as they exist in reality. Keeping in mind that Fallout 76 is a game that took place in a nuclear wasteland. So it was Woodburn Hall, but with zombies and holes in the roof, right? Um, it was a fun study to do. Why we submitted to TMB, um, we were very attracted by the open access model. And this came out of the TMS conference. And so there was a lot of homophily with the conversations we had been having. And as somebody who comes from a bit outside psychology mainstream, it helped me gather a lot of resources from other areas of literature, my own home in communication, geography, um, human computer interaction, and all of those coalesced around psychological principles. So I think the literature hits, the paper hits the literature in a way that spreads all of us a little better as opposed to just being in one silo. And I think the neatest thing, and for those of you who are able to engage with the actual link I've shared, there's interactive maps in the publication. So to, to, to kind of close on my end, when we worked with the publisher, once this cleared peer review, we were asked about ways that we could make this document live. And so what the PubPub did for us is they got a map of West Virginia. I went back in and played the game some more. That's really hard to do. And I pulled screenshots from famous locations in West Virginia, which the publisher superimposed on the map of West Virginia. So if you go into the document, you can take a tour and you can see the real places where they're at in the world and you can see the digital ones in the game. And we even got APA to help us clear it through legal. So, I mean, it really did. We just had this crazy idea. They did clear it all the way through. The document lives online. It lives interactively. This is a small study in what I hope is a much larger area of research. And that's why I think this journal is a great home for it. It's one of those pieces that I think will have a long tail as folks maybe rediscover this theory from the 70s. That's great, Nick. Thanks for your, uh, thanks for that story. Um, yeah, I love that. I love how the, what you did in terms of the interactive media. Uh, it, it's really great and I hope people check it out. One of the things that I think is really great about the panel today is that um, we all study game-based games, but from such different perspectives. So I study game-based learning, um, and Sean studies the effects of games on perception and uh, cognition more specifically. You study this very interesting aspect of games and social presence and the effects of games. Um, which I think is just fascinating. And Isabella studies uh, the effects of games on more um, clinical aspects, like anxiety, uh, um, uh, I don't want to call it psychopathology, but m more along that area. So we're really uh, using games or studying games in different purposes. Uh, and another interesting aspect of the group is Shauna 
Sean uh, did a study on uh, methods, well, a paper on methods, a very large paper, and I happened to be part of it. So that was one connection between Sean and myself. And then um, the next paper, I was very, I was so excited about it um, because Isabella uh, and her super team has did this paper on social media research and how, and the, 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 I'll just let you go with, go for it and talk about your paper rather than me telling everyone what your paper is about. Isabella, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so this paper, first of all, um, is headed up by my PhD student, Nastasia Griffin, and, um, and I probably pronounced that wrong because I'm awful with Dutch names. However, um, so she headed up this, this paper and what we did, we were sort of among a group of several others around the world who have uh, started to notice and get uh, frustrated with the kinds of work that's been coming out around um, looking at the relations between social media and uh, well-being in young people in particularly. And so beyond the hype of the sort of public media that we all know and the huge headlines around, you know, it's ruining a generation and so on, we were seeing something very, very different. A lot of our work starts with um, uh, talking with youth themselves and doing research on what they're doing, seeing what's on their phones. And um, we were seeing just, you know, in terms of our own intuitions, a very different picture about what young people were feeling when they were on uh, social media and using it for different purposes. And so first and foremost, what we wanted to do is look at in this paper uh, to review methodologically what was out there in the literature. And so we looked at 91 studies that had been published trying to look at the relation between uh, social media and well-being. And out of those 91 studies, um, you'll see that first top left uh, figure, the vast, vast, vast majority of them were self-reported, um, self-report measures. There's a cutoff there. I don't know why they, uh, it cut off, but anyway, um, so there were very, very few under 10 uh, papers that actually had any kind of more objective data or more qualitative data and so on. Um, and this self-report often did not, and we know this from now, great reviews coming out from Shablinsky's group and uh, Amy Orman's group, that these self-report measures often have nothing, no correlation with actually um, what the young people are actually doing. We are terrible at remembering what we do on these things. Either we get absorbed with it or we're in denial with it, or we are having such a good time with it that we just have a really bad way of um, keeping track of what we do on media. And so trying, we, we found that the vast majority of uh, studies were these self-report uh, studies, and we know that self-report didn't work. And then we also found that the vast majority of these studies were really looking at just duration or frequency that young people were using screen time. And it's screen time right now is now a ridiculous word. We're kind of all agree that it's not going to be a very useful word going forward because as we know young people and all of us use these um, digital devices um, in very different ways and what we are most con uh, you know concerned about and interested about and sort of excited about this sort of brave new world is understanding the functions of um, what these different digital interactions uh, serve in terms of developmental functions. So things like identity development and social interactions and autonomy and agency and all those things that have for millennia been important for young people and adolescents still are important for young people. And they are getting many of those needs met in their digital ecosystem. And so we often talk about this sort of hybrid system um, where young people don't distinguish very clearly between their online and offline worlds and their online and offline friends and so on. And they start, start weaving these relationships together such that talking about what they're doing and how long on screen time isn't working anymore in terms of understanding uh, what's really going on. So after doing this review and, and really kind of highlighting some of these limitations of past research, and to be clear, these limitations were there, I think in part because we came from a tradition of thinking about media as leisure activity. And now it's, it's so much, I mean, never mind the pandemic right now, where we all now can agree and we no longer are talking about bad and good because we're on this thing 12 hours a day and, and so on. But also, you know, over the last just decade or so, 
these media have started becoming our, the places that we socialize, the places that we work, the places that we learn, um, and not just the places that we, that we get entertained. Um, and so it's a really different kind of, I think, entirely different kind of beast of studying as well, which is why I'm very excited about this journal having uh, started up, because I think it provides a much larger um, sort of a uh, palette of ideas that we can think about around media. And so we ended, or, or we, we in part ended um, this, this paper by suggesting some um, improvements to old methods. And um, in particular, we used one example that Nastasia has really sort of spearheaded, um, and that is stimulated recall, uh, the stimulated recall method that comes from, I believe, sociology. Um, and, and basically what it does is it pulls together objective data with qualitative data, interview data, um, and in this really lovely way. And I can just really briefly tell you about a study that um, we used this and then we continue to do in other studies where we stress kids out in terms of a, uh, a Trier stress task. So, so young people get um, told they have to do a public speaking task. They get anxious around that. And then um, we let them, we say, you need to stay here for 10 minutes, we're out of here. And they are allowed to do whatever they want for that 10 minutes. And of course, I think like more than 90% of them pick up their phone, of course, right? Immediately, there's all, almost no lag. Nobody's gonna be surprised by that data. But then what we do after they've spent the 10 minutes doing whatever they do on their phone, we come back in and we say, okay, here's the real purpose of the study. And we want to join with you and talk with you about what you actually do when you're thinking about stress, like we just stressed you out. And when you're you know, using your phones, what are you doing with it? And we wanted to really understand, maybe they're regulating their emotions with, this, with these devices. Maybe sometimes it heightens their uh, anxiety. Sometimes it might um, uh, help them with that anxiety. So what this methodology does is, we take the objective data that they've got on their phone and we have a video camera record everything that they've done on their phone. We ask them, of course, afterwards um, if we are allowed to use it. And then we ask them moment by moment, what were you doing when you started tapping on here? When you were texting, what were you doing? What, what, um, what actual application were you on? Because it's not gonna surprise anyone that they're not on one or two, they're on 10 at the exact same time, everything's open. Um, and so we do this in-depth, interviewed, um, and Nastasia has done so many of these, talking to these young people, why did you go there? What did you say? Did it make you feel better or worse? And so on. Um, and so we, the, the stimulated recall part is that it's, it's right after they've done all these things. So they remember very well what they've done and why. And we can get this kind of rich, both quantitative and qualitative data. And this is just one suggested sort of almost ethnographic kind of uh, method so that we can understand better what young people are doing in these digital ecosystems. Um, so that was the paper and we were really excited to sort of share it with a broader audience. And so in terms of going to this journal, the reason why we were excited about um, trying to publish it in Technology, Mind and Behavior is that we get frustrated quite often. Many of our RCTs are published in these closed access uh, journals. So people like designers or even young people themselves or parents who really care about these things, teachers have no access to these uh, studies. And it's hugely frustrating for us because we wanna share this and we want them to join us in our research. And so for us, this was a perfect haven for this study. Wow, that's great, that's great. Um, and it's really great to um, think about mixing the qualitative aspects with quantitative. So you can imagine collecting uh, the self-report data, but then augmenting that with the stimulated recall, uh, recall and the in-depth interviews and creating a really a more multi-dimensional um, studies of uh, social media and their, their impact. So that's, yeah. that's exciting to me. So um, let's move for that. That's really great. Thank you so much. And then let's move uh, now to talk about the next exciting venture that uh, we're involved in. And that is the um, special issue. So Sean, you wanna take it from here and talk about our special issue? Yeah, sure can. Um, so uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, we launched a uh, special issue that you know is entitled technology mediated interactions uh, in the 
time of you know social distancing. It's a technology media interactions and their impact on the human mind and behavior in a time of social distancing. Um, Danielle and I went back many times as to whether it was better to have a verbose but highly informative title or a shorter, catchier one. And uh, as anyone who's ever read anything that I've written, I tend towards verbose. Uh, so <laughs> I think I must have won out. Um, so basically, the impetus for this special issue is when the COVID uh, pandemic hit, it basically, you know, as everyone knows, created massive disruptions in normal life and pushed lots of things online. And one thing that, you know, we all started to see, um, you know, discussions with uh, between Danielle and myself, you know, like all scientists, you know, we treated it as an opportunity. You know, it's like, well, yes, it's a massive disruption to our life. On the other hand, it's a massive disruption that we could treat as a manipulation or something of interest. And we realized that lots and lots of our colleagues were thinking along those lines. Uh, we're basically saying, well, we're going to take advantage of this situation and we're going to try to ask kind of scientific questions about the impact of social distancing or the impact of technology more generally in a time of social distancing or kind of we're interested in technology uh, mediated interactions and social distancing provides a really unique way to look at things or a lens. And so kind of it lended itself to a special issue in particular, I think a special issue in technology mind and behavior because of the interdisciplinary nature of the journal. Um, the fact that, you know, this is something that is pertinent to healthcare. Um, lots of healthcare interactions are being pushed online. Obviously incredibly relevant to education as we're trying to navigate in-person versus online um, education to how we socialize, you know, as we're having Zoom chats instead of in-person things. It kind of cuts across all the domains that are relevant to our journal um, in a really nice way. And so the core goal of the journal of the special issue was, well, people are going to be doing this work. Um, you know, it's a, a nice idea to put together a special issue that um, kind of ties it all together. And in particular, what we decided we wanted to do was to focus on what we call registered reports. Um, and I'll spend a little bit of time on registered reports because I know not everyone is familiar with that model of publishing. So, you know, I'm sure most people on this on this chat are familiar with the idea of pre-registering studies. You know, that it's increasingly part of our standard practice where, you know, we pre-register our methods um, and our hypotheses and our analyses um, as a way to say, re uh, reduce, you know, degrees of freedom with analyses or p-hacking or these kinds of things that um, we've seen are disruptive in social sciences. The idea behind a registered report goes a little bit further than that, which is, you know, someone will pre-register a study and submit it to a journal like ours. So in our case, you know, pre-register a study, submit it to a journal with, as the slide says, introduction that situates the question in the scientific literature and the theoretical background. Basically, why is this an interesting question? Why are you doing this study? What is the kind of scientific work in which this will, you know, um, speak to. The hypotheses to be tested, uh, the methodological plan in the same way you would with a standard pre-registration. So, you know, ends that are justified by power analysis, plans for exclusions, um, you know, analytic methods, you know, are you gonna be using linear models? Are you gonna be using nonlinear models, so forth? Um, and critically, how those analyses will speak to the hypotheses. Um, so, you know, uh, what would be a pattern of results that would falsify the hypotheses? What would be supportive of those hypotheses? And so that's submitted to the journal before the work is done. Um, you know, basically, this is what we are thinking of doing. Um, this is our plan. We send that out for review the way we would a paper. Um, the, the reviewer's job is to say, uh, is this a good idea? Are the methods sound? Are the ideas underlying the methods sound? Are the analyses likely to speak to important questions in the field. Um, and if the reviewers agree with all those things, you know, this is an important question, um, you know, it'll extend the, the field in a useful way, all the hypotheses are sound, the methods are sound, the analytic uh, plan is sound. Uh, we approve that, um, and then the authors go out and do the work. Um, and then regardless of what happens, and this is kind of one 
place that uh, lots of people have pushed towards best practices in science, regardless of what the outcome is. The reviewers have already said, this is an interesting question. The methods are sufficient to ask that question. Whatever happens, um, the paper is published. Um, so you know whether the hypothesis is supported or the hypothesis is falsified um, or failed to be supported, depending, um, the paper will be published. And so we thought that was a really nice model in this space because you know obviously the pandemic uh, has been kind of an acute shock and people are going to be doing lots of work and we thought it'd be a real shame if you know uh, it ended up being associated with say a lot of publication bias where during this time the things that worked out got published and then the things that didn't work well people go back to their normal line of research and they kind of don't worry about it anymore and it just gets thrown in the file drawer um, would be the the idiomatic expression. And so we really wanted to kind of provide an outlet where people who are doing work that um, speaks to these questions, it's gonna come out one way or another. Um, and, you know, we really wanted to promote that kind of uh, best practice science. And so we have for the special issue, um, as it says, the submission deadline uh, is uh, the end of September now. And so we have two forms of submission. So there's, all of them are registered reports, but we also recognize that lots of people already got a head start. They started doing some work. And so a second type of submission basically says, use that work that you've gotten a head start on as pilot data, and then pre-register follow-up work to it. Um, you know, that way, you know, you get to take advantage of the work that you've already started and, you know, do some confirmatory or some extension on the work that you've already been doing uh, again, kind of promoting best practices in this field. Um, and so, you know, the submission, submissions have already started coming in. And, you know, I think uh, we've been happy to see submissions come in. It's certainly a different model and takes an adjustment for everyone. Um, it takes an adjustment for authors, for editors, for reviewers, right? Reviewers, you know, anyone who's ever reviewed a paper, what you want to focus on is like the things you think are wrong and what they can change. Um, and really in this case, the reviewers kind of have to take a different mindset, which is, is this actually an interesting question and are the methods appropriate? Not, would I do this different if it was my work? Um, you know, could you add in this little bit and it might do something different? You know, as they proposed it, is this solid or not? Um, you know, and for authors, you know, what do you explain? It's, it's a little bit funny to us that we always justify to ourselves the experiments that we're doing. Um, but we don't always have to write down this registered report. Here's the literature, you know, I'm, you know, I always write my introductions the last part of a paper I write, um, usually, um, right? And so it's an interesting model now where, you know, you have to write all this stuff ahead of time. And by and large, um, the introduction to the registered report, we expect it'll be the introduction to the final paper. All of that background is still relevant regardless of what the results are. Um, and so for people doing the proposing, you know, kind of taking the point of view, all right, well, what does the reviewer need to know to know if this is a good idea or not? What's the relevant literature that they need to know to know if this is situated appropriately? Um, what's the theoretical framework um, that they need to be able to evaluate? Because it's not just a question of whether or not the methods are okay. It's are the methods okay um, or acceptable to push the field forward. Um, and so you really need all of these components together. Um, and so it's been an interesting process and one that I'm happy to answer um, questions about. Um, and we would, you know, this is obviously a group that we would welcome submissions from, you know, for this type of, um, uh, for this special issue, um, especially if you're thinking about doing things that are coming up. I know uh, lots of schools, for instance, have, planned closures. So at the University of Wisconsin, we basically, uh, we are hybrid through Thanksgiving, and then we have a planned shift to online, right? So I know I have colleagues that are basically um, planning on taking advantage of that planned shift. We know that there's going to be a transition for all of these kids from some amount of in-person interaction to fully online interactions. Um, can we leverage that in some way? So. Uh, yeah, I think that's the overview of the special issue. And yeah, again, be happy to answer uh, questions on that. Um, and um, I might throw some of the questions to Nick and Isabella, who are uh, two of the action editors on it. Great. Um, I, there are some really interesting aspects of registered reports. I want to make sure that everybody knows that 
uh, technology, mind, and behavior accepts registered reports um, uh, on a variety of any topic related to technology, mind, and behavior. And then also I want people to know that, of course, we're also accepting papers on this topic that were not registered. Um, the, and the mindset of technology, mind, and behavior is that we need a uh, more um, open a science approach to publication in the sense that we will publish replications, we will publish null results if they are well uh, established, so to speak. And um, we're open to a variety of modes of publication in terms of whether it's um, uh, registered, a replication, um, uh, null results, uh, and so on. So um, I think um, we can um, start to move toward um, questions. Do we have, do we have questions? Oh, I see. Jay is um, actually sending the questions through. Yep, um, to the chat. So uh, the, getting the it first... now. Now I'm understanding. Uh, why don't you go ahead and read the questions for us, Jay? All right. So um, Athira asked, the internet and related technologies seem to nurture our behaviors and personality. Does technology shape us or is it, uh, is it who shaped technology? Well, um, that's, that's an excellent question. And I think it's really a question that um, it is very appropriate for the journal. And I wonder if, because Nick is just nodding his head off, <laughs> maybe you have a, an opinion on this. Well, gosh, in some ways, it, you almost get into epistemological fights over right technological determinism versus the social shaping of technology. And, and, and Danielle, I was going to say more than anything, I don't, if any of us were equipped to answer that question, we would get a crown and like a throne that floats above the earth where we could answer these questions, right? But that is sort of the, gosh, at the broadest level, what I think motivates a lot of technology-minded behavior research. Um, you know, the answer will almost invariably be both, and it depends, right? Um, but what I might suggest, a uh, theory, as you go into your work and think about the ways in which you read this work, you know, those two frames tell very different stories about how we study media effects and how we study media usage and motivation. Um, so it's a good thing that it's a, almost philosophical question that can help you think about how you approach technology and technology research. Because um, the different questions you're going to ask as a result of this one are, are almost fundamentally different, right? Uh, if we're talking about the social shaping of technology where we make tools for us versus the idea that once we make this, everything changes, right? Um, and I think a lot of iterations of the research you're going to see published in this journal and other similar journals oftentimes talk about this issue in their discussion sections. And so I promise I'm not dodging the question, but what I'm suggesting is it's kind of one of those, to me, it's, it's, it's a question that animates the research. You know, I tend to fall strictly down the middle because you, you see evidence of both, right? I'm thinking of Isabella's work where you're looking at, um, you know, how children make sense of these gaming environments in ways that can feed into their psychological well-being. Um, well, some humans had to create that product to begin with, with the intention of shaping who we are, but the need for that intention came from a social force that was taking the volition away from us. So I would definitely not answer it so much as to say that's something that animates how we read this work and how we do this work. Yeah. Isabella, what, what, what do you have Yeah, just, just to build on that, I think that it's also almost, um, th there is no the dichotomy, it reminds me of genetic, you know, gene environment kind of thing. I think more, for me, the most interesting question is how do they, you know, mutually sort of shape? Because not only is this question sort of fundamental, but also that the new technologies are now built in such a way that the self-authoring 
you know, web 2.0 kind of thing where people are changing, the actual participants are changing the characteristics of that very technology. Even if it was designed for one purpose, it's being reappropriated for other purposes. And a lot of times in the ways that young, especially young people are using it and hacking away at it. And so I think even if there was a design that was one there and it was supposed to have an impact on the user in a certain particular way, we can already see that the user then changes that technology in that very simple way. And I think that's the exciting part of this work. Absolutely. Great. Um, Jay? So there's a, a more technical question that came in from R. Daniels. Is there a processing fee that is linked to publishing for this journal similar to other open access venues? Yes, there is. Um, so the processing fee for a lot of journals is pretty uh, open access journals is fairly high, uh, over 2000. APA has set this at 1200 per uh, paper, but they're covering 400 of that for, for a while, I think for at least the first year. Um, and then if uh, for those who can't afford uh, for any, for some reason to pay that processing fee, then they simply fill, fee, fill out a um, fee waiver and APA will uh, consider that. So in essence, I, I don't think that the cost of the publication fee should be a determinant uh, a fact, a determining factor for whether or not you uh, submit. One thing I could add to that for, um, a lot of folks, especially early career scholars, um, often don't know about some of these programs. But at least in the United States, a lot of libraries and um, either uh, join consortiums where some of these fees, believe it or not, are already paid for, and you right. may not even know it, yeah. um, especially for member institutions and things like that. Um, there are oftentimes open access um, funds. And the reason libraries do this is they see it as mutually beneficial because if the university buys it, they also know they have access to it. Right. And sometimes with the way journal economics are changing, you're seeing more and more universities that are willing to pay what seems like a lot of money to us, but on their budget for resource acquisition is surprisingly small. I, I've been at uh, three large R1 institutions and one smaller institution that all had some form of open access budget. So for folks who are on the line, I might encourage you to look at those things. I, I've been surprised in my short time doing admin work how often sometimes those budgets never get applied for. And so at the end of the year, there's, believe it or not, ten to $15,000 left over in a budget because folks just didn't, didn't know about the access fees. So something to check into for sure. Yeah, a lot of universities are actually calling on people to use open access. Yeah. Um, and uh, granting agencies are also, some granting agencies are requiring you. Yeah to use open access in some form, whether you post it afterwards or use open access and um, they provide funds for that as well. Um, so that's, that's really, that's an important, that's a good point, Nick, thanks. I just want to encourage uh, anyone who has a question to go ahead and post it in the chat because we have, uh, I think, room for a few more. Also, I'll apologize in advance. I have an adolescent interacting with technology in the background. <laughs> um, I do have a question for uh, Nick, and that is about your the sense of space that you talk about in your study and how it was measured. And then um, on or with that, uh, the um, the emotions that were affecting sense of space, was that the intensity of the emotion or the type of emotion? Both great questions. And I'll address the first one about the measurement with kind of a side pitch to why open access matters. And I should be full disclosure, I'm a pretty big fan of tra open transparency and open science work. And what I'm referring to there is when you publish research, publishing more of your research. I don't mean more papers, although that would be nice, but publishing your materials, your data sets. So in the paper for, for, for TMB, if you go to my paper or our paper, it's a team effort, there's a link to our data sets and our survey metrics and everything we can legally share. I couldn't give you a copy of Fallout 76, although it didn't sell very well. So maybe, maybe they'll let me do that if I ask nicely. Um, I'm still gonna answer the question, but the nice thing is if you read the paper, you can download the entire survey, like in Word and PDF and Qualtrics, and then you have the researchers exact metric that they use for their study. I love the question, Jerry, because it was a bit of a mess. We, we found a sense of place work from a dissertation and that, that was done in the early 2000s. And that was the only place we could find somebody who had taken this very sort of almost rhetorical concept 
and tried to quantify it into a scale. So we did have a scale. We borrowed it from a dissertation coming out of Colorado State. We took their items and refactor analyzed them because there was a lot of violations uh, uh, happening with the, they had like a four factor structure. It wasn't really working out that way. Um, but it's a self-report scale. I believe we ended up with 11 items that did retain dimensions of the original scale, but in a much more abbreviated format. Um, your standard self-report, Likert style, one to seven. Uh, and, and I'm happy to share that, and it's also in the paper. Um, so self-report for there. We also asked people to recall going with the mixed method uh, a notion. Uh, we had them talk about their senses of place. Now, we didn't analyze their larger description simply because we ran, we ran out of space, but we did look at their recollection of places as a, as a memory trace, because although sense of place isn't just, I remember Main Street, remembering Main Street is part of sense of place. Mm -hmm. And so our second set of analyses that are in the paper also looked at their, rec their free recall of locations. So we had a combination of self-reports of free recall with the measurement items for sense of place in my future work, I'm actually hoping to dig into those items a little more and, and do some construct validation studies. For example, comparing them to measurements of presence and other measurements that also talk about locations. So 11 item scale is the short answer, but the sausage behind that scale, fortunately is also published in the paper. And you, know, you can have a pretty good time with some R code and some SPSS code and a really long anonymous data set. And you'll learn a lot about West Virginia too, which is pretty fun. As for emotions, we didn't look at specific emotions, um, and we, we probably should have. That would be a fantastic place for future research, and I know that's like the standard answer when you didn't do something, but the way I saw this paper really was introducing a concept, or rather reintroducing the concept to get people excited about it again, so it would have that heuristic quality to kind of push us forward. A lot of the reviewers asked a similar question, and that was kind of my go-to answer. Uh, we don't know what emotions were connected. And I think even Sean brought this up once that what if I see my hometown and it's been melted by a bomb? Like that might not be a positive emotion that I have towards that experience, right? And there's some anecdotal evidence where people would talk about their hometowns not being represented correctly. You know, oh, that square is off, that house is wrong. Or they didn't grow up in a place that they like. Just because it's home doesn't mean you like it, right? Um, we didn't get to that level of granularity. That would absolutely be the next stage is, is to look at how they made sense of the environment. You know, even something as simple as taking like a uh, circumflex approach to this. You know, so looking at the activation and deactivation states and looking at the valence of the emotions, that would be a really cool moderating variable, I think, in this work. Not to mention that in some ways the sense of place isn't as interesting to me as what it does to us downstream, whether it's in fact impacting our learning, impacting our entertainment, impacting, you know, the social lessons we take from something, you know, so I think that's really the key is pushing it past that being the dependent variable and how that variable impacts something that might be much more clinically or socially relevant down the road. The one I think of immediately is this idea of eudaimonia and meaningfulness, and how do you extract, you know, self-reflection out of a out of a media event and think about yourself in in deeper detail. But thank you for the question; I loved it. So there's a question for Isabel. Can you go into deeper details on the issues uh, for young people, separating out or distinguishing between online, offline, screen, not screen time? Yeah, absolutely. So I have become, with my uh, research groups, quite obsessed with thinking about identity in particular and um, thinking about uh, identity development in adolescence. And it's sort of the, the you know, main developmental goal that adolescents have is to construct a coherent and agentive um, identity for themselves. And so when you think about what young people are doing, they're not doing this just offline with their friends in the playgrounds or in their uh, the malls, or and they're not doing it just digitally either. And there are things that people call these things spillover effects or context collapse, um, where I think it's, it's actually uh, Boyd that talks about context collapse. But the point is that for for example, if I feel like I have been given lots of uh, positive 
um, reinforcement around my appearance on social media. When I get off, I feel great and I just, uh, I go out to the party. There isn't a real uh, distinguishing fact, like is it the offline or the online kind of experience of self-esteem that just boosted me and into this other context? Or there are, I mean, if you ask my two 14 year old boys, they will come, come to me today and say, wow, that friend of mine is driving me nuts. I'm like, what friend? Who have you seen? And of course they, and they've never seen these people. And they, there's no way that I can question whether these are true friends after playing for two years with these same people. So there, when we, as you know, at least I can call myself the older generation, think about uh, friendships and like close friendships, or we think about, um, you know, the dramas of breaking up and so on. These things are happening in both contexts and they influence one another such that I actually think that it really is for some people at this point, such a hybrid reality that, that parsing it is really difficult. And we want to understand, for me, I want to understand much more the function of these digital spaces that actually work developmentally in both contexts and, and weave themselves in a way that there is no um, clear barrier or, um, or boundary. And I think it's gonna become more and more so um, as, as more of our lives. I mean, if any of you have been parenting at home and being in this digital context where you know somebody physically comes in your face and then you're also texting with somebody else, um, all of those emotional and social interactions are happening somewhere in the middle there. So that's what I mean by distinguishing between physical and digital is getting more and more difficult. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering why we even need to do it in most cases, because I feel like a lot of meaning is taken out of those experiences for those people. It really reminds me of the concept of social, social cognition. So we're, we're, we are extended by our social environment and that social environment may be digital or in person but uh, it's an extension of ourselves, which is multidimensional. So to think of ourselves on, in a, just three dimensions is no longer viable. I would say that that type of perspective would be something that, the, that a journal like this would really be able to breed because we, we are seeing that logic take shape, I think, in technology research. We, we've, uh -huh. we've gotten away from screen time being the indicator of addiction, for example, and even in game, mm -hmm. and we've moved past that, right? Well, the functional approaches are far more relevant than just a simply touch yes or no approaches. And um, it's simply the case, and, and, and it was what you put, and you both put it so well, um, the distinction only exists because this screen is flat, right? Like right. if it has the ability to impact me, it impacts me. I mean, no, no better place can be seen this than if you're following politics right now, right? It's not as if those are fake debates and the real debates happen in my yard. No debates happen in my yard. My yard is me and the dogs. All the debates happen on screen and they cause people to vote certain ways. And I think we're maturing somewhat as technology researchers. And some of us have been doing it that way for a long time and we're seen as more fringe. And now we're starting to see the people who are taking, I think, technological or media interactions seriously. You know, I, I come from the comm field, for example, suddenly it's no longer like seen as optimistic research or normative research. It's seen as just descriptive because we live online and certainly you know, the, the pandemic has catalyzed, as Sean put it earlier, which motivated the special issue. We knew this was happening, but now we can't not take it seriously because we're right here. This call is a great example. It's still impacting me. I'm still learning things. I'm just wearing shorts instead of, you know, slacks. I'm curious, are you seeing other people use these new social media research tools with digital immigrants, older generations, or is this still primarily focused on younger generations? Are you asking? Uh, well, specifically uh, you, Isabella, but uh, I did not know mm -hmm. whether in the context of what you're seeing come into the journal, if you're, uh, if you're aware of those. Yeah, so, so in our work, we focus on youth, but I, I do think that we all know adults that are using maybe some different platforms, but they're still using um, a lot. I think that's one of the more interesting things too, is that we now have a generation of parents who are basically almost digital uh, natives. And so the way that they uh, view media and interactions um, of their children is, is different, I think, than for example, when I was parented. And those dynamics, I, I find those cohort effects are fascinating. Um, in terms of the journal, I haven't had as many, uh, I, I so far have only reviewed a couple so, um, and they were not necessarily youth focused. I think they're the sort of now of everybody uh, using them, yeah. 
Yeah. I feel like in a global level, we are seeing these shifts. Um, certainly like in conversations I have with colleagues in, in the communication and media conferences where there was a recognition, there, there was a big a meta-analysis, uh, scoping review published a few years ago in media psychology. And one of the things that critiqued our, our field for was all we studied was Facebook. And that was basically it. And we knew a whole bunch about Facebook and a whole bunch about how kids use Facebook. And by kids, we really meant like college sophomores. And in response to that, people were starting to realize fake news debates, those are not college student samples. Those are working adult samples, right? Uh, we started seeing research with um, 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 retirees who were feeling distal from their, you know, in US culture, we don't do a great job of caring for, for our, our older adults. We just kind of, we tend to isolate them a little bit. And there's been an increase in research or at least interest in research on how they use social media to engage. And the gaming panel at this conference or earlier this morning, they were talking about the use of Animal Crossing by grandmothers as a way to play with their grandchildren during a time of a pandemic because they could all visit this, their island and play, play toys. And then as Isabella mentioned, you're seeing a lot more as the parents, I think the average gamer in the US is 34. It's their parent. Um, to them, it's not weird to play games with their kid. And in fact, in my own research with my colleagues, Tim Wolf and others in Germany, and we, our nostalgia and gaming research, it turns out that the games themselves aren't as nostalgic as the memories around the games. And they almost always involve a mention of a family member, a brother, a sister, or, or a mom or a dad. And we've had several unsolicited stories where somebody will say, oh, I remember this game. Before my father died, we played Mario Kart every Friday. And um, that's been interesting to see the data and the changes around assuming technology is for kids. As those things change, it's becoming uh, increasingly normative to start looking towards, okay, who are the real populations here? It's the voters, it's the retirees. And again, I think this uh, pandemic will catalyze some of that work. And you know, again, a journal like this for, for folks listening, you know, doesn't have some of the established biases that other journals might have, whether it's qual or quant or this sample or that sample, you know, but Jay, it's a great question. And I think it needs to be, more work needs to be done, but we are talking about doing it at least. It's no longer seen as strange or there's no extra rationale for why your sample's average age is 45, where I think 10 years ago, you would have had to argue for it pretty heavily why it matters. And I would just add on there that to some extent, some of the technology has made asking some of those questions more accessible. So anyone who's tried to like, get a sample of middle-aged adults, um, it's like there's a reason that in psychology we have research on kids, college students, and elderly or older adults. And there's this chunk between 25 and 55 that, you know, it's just a gap. Uh, it's partially because it's impossibly difficult to get people of that age group to come into labs to do things and so uh, we found that, you know, uh, one kind of, um, not only are they more implicated, because as Nick noted, you know, this is, you know, this is my generation, grew up with some of these things that we're now interested in, um, but you can access them to ask questions. Um, and so I think there'll be more research on that cohort than there has been in the past, because we can now ask them to do things, you know, not just ask, you know, qualitative survey-based questions, but have them do cognitive tasks or perceptual tasks or learning tasks. You know, there's huge interest in, um, you know, parent-child interactions that we can now view, um, just have them FaceTime the researcher in, in their actual household yeah. rather than have to bring them to the lab that, you know, um, so I, I think that'll be a, a, a funny knock-on effect of the technology is that it'll allow us to ask some of these kind of cohort questions in a more sensible way. Um, it's really interesting if you look at any of meta-analyses that are, uh, by age group, you'll, regardless of what domain you're in, you will see a gap from 25 to 55 where there's like two studies. Um, and I think uh, that'll, that'll slowly go away. So apropos of some of the intergenerational effects, there was another question that came in um, about whether the technology usage during COVID is having an impact on the psychological well-being of the family structure. Yeah, so I think, I mean, I can start and then I'll turn to Isabella. Um, so, I mean, I guess my, you know, I think one thing and it touches a lot on what Nick has already said and Isabella's already said is uh, one thing that we're getting much better at is uh, 
uh, drilling down to more fine grain questions. You know, um, rather than what's the impact of technology, which is way too big, uh, what's the impact of screens, still too big, what's the impact of social media, still too big, um, right? You know, um, getting, you know, much more detailed. Uh, and I think that's uh, gonna be a real positive in our domain. Uh, one thing I didn't mention in our um, discussion of the special issue, but it's really important to us is that um, not only does the question need to be solid and the method solid, the work needs to propagate forward when the pandemic is over um, or when the technology that you're studying no longer exists. You know, Nick, you know, mentioned Facebook, but before the research on Facebook, there's a whole literature on MySpace. Um, and a lot of that literature is tied entirely to MySpace. And now that MySpace is not used, that work isn't cited anymore. Um, and one thing we're really trying to promote with this journal is, um, you know, the technology is gonna change a ton. And so the research can't be tied to the technology, can't be tied to the time and place. It needs to propagate forward somehow. And so, you know, I think for the question of technology and COVID, right? It's like, all right, drill down to which chunk of that um, is it? Um, but happy to hear my, my panelists thought on that as well. Yeah, I could jump in. I think that it's really been useful for us to think about affordances of technologies rather than specific technologies, right? So rather than thinking about Instagram versus Snapchat versus, it's again, going back to function and what, how are the designs of these technologies um, influencing people and so it, and it can be very different you know the the like button in one context can be the same thing as some other gesture or whatever because it functions the same way socially and I think those kinds of getting a taxonomy of affordances I think is going to be really important going forward because we are still evolutionarily the same with the, you know humans um, as we've been for thousands and thousands of years so th there are ways of actually um, parsing the kinds of activities that we do with our di digital technologies according to those key kind of, for me, most interesting developmental functions, but you can imagine all sorts of other taxonomies that you can map onto technological affordances. And as the technologies change, presumably we can still have something solid enough with those uh, uh, affordances that we can do some research across, you know, even decades, right? And I think, I think that's really important. The question around COVID to me is, much, I find it fascinating that now the media questions I get are no longer, is this, are really video games not bad for you and so on. It's immediately about how do we, you know, let parents feel less guilty? How do we allow for a whole diet of digital media now that we're all on it anyway, right? And so it's so much about these kinds of mindsets. Yeah. And I think one of the things that is good about this that's going to come out is that hopefully there's going to be less stigmatizing of digital use in young people because I think that might have a larger negative impact on young people than the actual use themselves, right? So maybe there's going to be an interesting uh, shift around having all of us have been so digital and thinking less of, of pathologizing that activity. You know, on that point, there, there's some research uh, from some colleagues of mine, um, Allison Eden and Benjamin Johnson and a few others, uh, Tilo Hartman, I think, I may have the, the names wrong on some of those, but they're finding evidence of this thing called a guilty couch potato effect. So to give you an example, we know video games have some restorative principles uh, that can help us um, satisfy intrinsic needs, you know, the, the self-termination theory approach. Um, but if you're made to feel guilty about your media use, those restorative effects disappear. Um, that's fascinating because oftentimes these uh, restorative effects are implicit. We're not explicitly going, gosh, I could use more autonomy right now. Where is that Game Boy, right? We feel a sense of constriction and we're not feeling good. We reach over and of our environment, the things that we can control are quite limited. And one of the things we can control is our media taken. So we take up some media and we play for a while and we get this short-term benefit by, by satisfying that itch, that, that need. But then we feel guilty about it, and we already have data showing that when you feel guilty about your media use, any benefits you would have had disappear, right? And so I love this conversation around, A, you know, we're being forced to reconcile some of our biases because maybe it's not a luxury anymore. You know, I don't, it's no longer a luxury for me to go see mom. This is the only way I'm seeing my mom, right? It's if I call her on my video phone. And, and as many of us have talked about in this session, and I would love to see that work in the journal as well, is shifting towards that taxonomy. 
and even further talking about the relationship between features and affordances, right? Because this device might objectively have 10 buttons and 10 features and they do different things, but then different people perceive the features in different ways, which changes the affordance pattern, which changes how they process the information, which changes how they use the information. And this is all work that we're talking about and we're only just now seeing it bud and grow. And I think as we start thinking more from that human computer interaction perspective and user experience perspective um, and really getting away from whether it's good or bad and instead just thinking about what does this device afford me in my daily life, um, it's going to really help us make some sound decisions. And I think the work coming out of that more than anything, and I love the notion of the taxonomy of affordances, it speaks towards explication, right? And it speaks towards getting back in and getting strong definitions and strong concepts, which oftentimes we focus so much on our analysis and our data bits that we, we kind of forget to define the things we're talking about. Um, affordances was a surprisingly messy literature for a while because we would use different terms. And that's going to really help us unpack how technology works because we get it at a, at, a, at a granular level. That, as Sean pointed out in Isabella, it, it doesn't stick to one technology. Interactivity is not the domain of video games, right? Lots of technologies are interactive. They're just interactive at different levels towards different ends. And that's going to be a lot of fun. Well, I can breathe a sigh of relief as a parent. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, maybe, maybe I should, I wasn't, I was holding myself back, but I do want to, as a parent or a person who, who's lived through other aspects of this, you know, it is important to think about um, the path that there are pathological uh, aspects of media use and media games. It's not that much different than addictive behavior, but it is how it's being used. So I wouldn't, as a parent, simply say, oh, media is fine. Um, you can go take a break. Um, it's all positive. It's all good. Um, because it's, it's not. I've seen it destroy lives. And um, so it's how it's used. It's like a glass of wine. So do you have one glass of wine or do you have four bottles? Um, and so it's important to think about not only what's being used and what are the aspects are being used, but how it's being used and how can we how can we uh, uh, leverage it in a positive way? So I think we, I, I don't see any other questions and I think we've actually reached our time limit. I just wanted to say, thank you. I'm gonna turn it back to Jerry Lynn, but I thought this was fascinating and very enlightening. So thank you everyone. Yes, I, I agree with you, Jay, and uh, really uh, hit several of my areas of interest in research. So. I'm uh, really passionate about continuing this conversation in a multiple of ways, but I want to thank you again because this was fascinating to hear about all of your individual research, but also about the American Psychological Association launching um, their newest open access journal. I'm thrilled to pieces to have you guys on, on, um, in, and love to be able to be involved in some at some point. I know a lot of my uh, students, as I had mentioned to you, we've been going to the uh, Technology Mind and and uh, Society, I think it was called, right? Uh, yeah. and at conferences, that, that was our sweet spot, but um, really excited about that. So I wanted to let everybody know thank we're now so taking much. a break. Uh, sorry. Thank you so much for inviting us and for yeah. having us and for hosting this uh, panel. It's been, uh, it's been a joy to be here. Thank you. Stay in touch. Well, Thanks. Yes, I, I hope that there's future iterations of this and certainly next year when we do this again, but we're not going to wait that long. Uh, so we want to let everybody know we're taking a break now. It's uh, 1230 p.m. on the Pacific Coast. Uh, do the math for whatever time zone you're in. It'll be a half an hour break. Suggest that you go and look at the posters and pre-recorded talks that are in there. And then we'll be meeting back at 1 p.m. Pacific and a half an hour from now. And there'll be one room and the panelists will be discussing parasocial relationships during the pandemic. And that'll be followed by a Q&A. There'll be two more uh, sessions after that. Both um, should be quite interesting, a social justice discussion and then networking. Since we can't all be in the room, same room sharing a cocktail, we're gonna try to do the, best, the next best thing and have some breakout rooms where we all get to um, uh, engage with each other. So thank you again, fantastic um, presentation, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.